Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dancers Podcast. I am your host, Dan Donahue. We have a really fun episode with my good friend and incredible comedian, Brad Wenzel. He has a special out called Joke, Joke, Joke. I call it Jokes, Jokes, Jokes in the interview a couple of times before I'm corrected, and I'm sorry, okay? But uh, you can check it out. I'm going to have it be the featured video at the end of this video, so you can just click the link at the end of this video. A uh, couple of things. You can uh, subscribe on here, please, on YouTube. It helps a lot. And check out the Patreon. You get an ep- extra, extra, extra episode of Dancers every single... I, I always sound like a car salesman when I'm pitching the Patreon. But no money down. Da- well, $5 down. New episode every week. And you get to look at the back catalog of episodes, too. So that's cool. Um, all right. Without further ado... Enjoy me and my good friend, Brad Wenzel. So in eyes depth, on the camera? Eyes on the camera. Dude, just look down. Just, just look, look down. down. It's the safest place. Um, <laughs> I try to... Uh, I try to... I'm, I'm a very in-depth interviewer, but if you... I'm very resource protective. Have you ever heard that hurt word with dogs? No, no. It's, a, it's a word people use with dogs when they just have a dog that will attack you. They go, <laughs> oh, they're resource protective. Okay. It means that they'll attack you if you touch any of their things. Okay. So genuinely don't look at you during No, that. of oh, course okay. not. I, I was like, God damn. <laughs> at first I was like, it's a bit, but then you <laughs> it kept going. And then I was like, I was like, oh man, he's got a thing. I do. Okay. So sometimes I do have to uh, work on this. <laughs> I love playing with uh, the joke of being hyper aggressive, <laughs> but it's hard because sometimes I am hyper aggressive, so it's not that funny. Right. It didn't even. It wasn't even coming off aggressive to me. It was right. coming off as um, when it, this happens all the time with comics. Sure. Where it's like, oh, there's like my friend who's a comic, funny, normal guy, and then if you actually spend time with them, like outside of a show, they'll be like, oh, and here's my one crazy thing. This is the most psychotic and, person I've and, ever met. And then you'll be, they'll be like, I can't, um, I can't do hallways. <laughs> And and then there's always something like that. So I was like, at first I was like, he's kidding. I was like, oh wait, he actually gets uncomfortable if you look at him in the. Dude, okay, you know this is this is my favorite. Are we going? Yeah, Are we're we... going. We're oh, going. okay. Uh, this is my favorite uh, story, and it's good because it's with a good comic that is now well known, Brian Simpson. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. I, uh huh. I I was driving Brian to a gig in San Diego. I had never met him before, and we have like the best conversation of all time. It's uh-huh. just like really flowing. He's so interesting. He's so nice. It's a long drive too. It's so a long. You, you can really get to know somebody. Really, and, and we did. Drive, it yeah. was like heavy traffic. Like really got to know him, and uh, and he like he just finishes saying something, and we're just sitting there in silence for one second, and he just starts snoring immediately. <laughs> he's just as, he's just fucking asleep. <laughs> He just turns asleep, and I, I was talking to, uh, I was talking to Keith Johnson about it after, and I was like, "Yeah, man, like it was a really good ride, but I think I was like boring him because in the middle, he, and Keith was like, "No, no, no, that's just something he does. He just falls Is asleep." Is he narcoleptic? I don't know. Uh, his roommates have really funny videos of him falling asleep on the couch in like insane angles, so it might be yeah. something along those lines. But undiagnosed, though, undiagnosed. So he's yeah, never yeah, yeah. cluing you in. Like, hey, I might. <laughs> I might pass out immediately. No, at no, any time. no, which is good. I I like that because when something is undiagnosed, it's just quirky. <laughs> yeah, right. That's what a quirk yeah, is. It's an yeah. undi usually an undiagnosed takes issue. The edge off. It's yeah. beautiful. So uh, I wanted to talk a little about it because I did. I watched uh, your special that you j- dropped online. Uh, jokes, jokes, jokes. It's so funny. Oh, thank it's you, it's really great. I wanted to ask you. The style that you have of just sort of like something I love about it is I think a lot of people think they need a gimmick with a comedy special. And right, some right. gimmicks are like kind Sometimes of interesting great. and yeah, fun. Yeah. But the issue is when people think they need and you see it with showcasing sometimes where people will go up and they think they need like a hook to their set. They think they need to do a right. dance number or whatever. Right, right, right. W- did you always just kind of uh feel like you were comfortable doing just stand up or did that come with a time it was interesting because like that's how i always did it yeah but then um stand up kind of changed over the years where um that what i what i kind of do like just like very like non sequitur joke heavy right stand up 
that went from being like that was so out of style especially like um like seven eight years ago like it was um, it was like autobiographical or you're kind of like kind of like we're not interested right but i always kind of for better or worse stuck to like my style and so then it it went with uh, not just gimmicks but just like trends in stand-up in general eventually the way i do it became almost like a novelty in itself so it's like oh my my gimmick is that i'm just doing a style that's not as common now even though it's kind of like the most uh you know basic or traditional yeah you know what i mean that became that i'm like a i I had a dude in louisville come up after a show i had a really fun show in louisville and he was like uh and this is inaccurate but what he said he was like what's it like being one of the one of the last one-liner comics (laughs) like like i was an endangered species yeah man and there's a bunch of one-liner comics sure but like uh but to to like the general public they're like oh this is a little this is like I don't see this all the time now. It's you know? so funny. It's so interesting. It's such an interesting way to put it where it kind of circled all the way around from being like the standard norm into being a thing that was notable to people. Like they showed right, up and right. they were like, oh, this is interesting because it's different from what the norm has shifted to. It's so funny. Well, and right, one liner right. comics, man, it, it's tough because people don't understand the meat and potatoes, which uh, this is kind of getting out of stand-up but like Mm. the mean potatoes of most stand-up comics who are just road people is getting an hour turning it over performing it all over and then getting a new hour right right. and for i mean just so much fucking harder when you're doing one liner (laughs) it's just so you it's like just like so dense yeah one like the upside of like not being known (laughs) is i can (laughs) i can really take the time i need to do it if i was like not that I'm turning it down, but if I was like a famous comic, like a right. Netflix theater act, I don't know how exactly I would yeah. do that turnover. Because it takes me like, uh, it's hard to judge because the pandemic kind of, this was like my second time turning over my act. Yeah. And so the pandemic kind of skewed the the timeline. Right. Um, but it takes probably like three or four years for me to like turn over my like 45 minutes, you know? Yeah. So it, it definitely, yeah, it, it takes a lot. I, I always describe it as it's, um, as far as turning it over, it's like a, a comic who has long jokes, which is the, the better way to be, is uh, you got to put together an eight piece puzzle. It doesn't take that many drafts. And if your jokes are short, you got to do a 70 piece puzzle. So it's all trial and error of going like this joke works, but where does it live in a 45 minute set? That's the part that takes me the longest is just trial and error of like, if I do this 10 minutes in it bombs, but if I do it 32 minutes in it kills and figuring that out 70 times. Right. You know what I mean? Now this will get into something I wanted to ask you, but did any, when you started off, in my scene, there were these guys, very incredibly small scene I started with, and there were these older guys that, at the time, I like respected the shit out of. I still do in a way, mm. but I realized as I got older, oh, they were talking out of their ass. Like, they were big oh, fish in yeah. a small pond. In your scene, when you started, did anyone ever try to deter you from that? N- only only one guy who's like a dear friend, oh, okay. like, to this day, but he just was, like, wrong. Um <laughs> It happens with dear friends where, all the time. Yeah, where he he was uh, he was trying to be helpful. Where he was like he kind of looked at my style of like this is a phase, and you need to like stop doing that and kind of get into the what is the trend. Yeah, and I was like at the time I was kind of like what the fuck, you know. <laughs> and then like years later, I was like he, he was he was wrong. And then uh, years later, I mentioned it, and he was like, ah, I was going through a lot at that time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I was that, like, because we were buddies. So I was like, remember that time you gave me horrible advice? And then he was, he was like, oh yeah, I was a, uh, I was figuring out my my medication or something. It's great you were able to yeah. confront him about that because most of the time when people give you horrible advice, you're not able to talk about it in retrospect. Oh yeah, so much time had passed. It was literally funny. It was yeah, yeah ancient yeah. history. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, a lot of the times when people are giving advice, it is coming from a distinctly personal place oh yeah yeah i don't i've always thought that 
at large, especially with comics, is go everyone only knows the way they did it. Right. So you have to completely take all advice through that prism of totally. like they they're only going to tell you how they did it because that's all we know. And I'll catch myself doing the same thing. Right. Where like with a young comic or something, they'll be asking me something. I'll be like, here's how I did it. But that might not be relevant to how you're going to do it. I try to kind of like you know, not put too much emphasis because it is, it's just all, it's all, uh, unique to, to your experience. And you got to like, uh, look at the source too. Sometimes where you go like, okay, that person has never, um, have you ever seen them do well or work any, anywhere? Like maybe don't like put them on a pedestal of, you know, consider the source, you know, when, so, did you wh- when did you like kind of start this method were you did you start in uh michigan yeah yeah Where, yeah. what part of michigan uh so the detroit scene oh which, cool. yeah so it was like um detroit metro detroit there were like three um long-standing clubs there's still two of them are still there and then there's a bunch of new clubs now and then uh yeah, I started Detroit, Ann Arbor, Southeast Michigan. Toledo also is not far. Okay. And uh, Lansing, Michigan. Did you... There's all these cities like within an hour, kind of within an hour, depending where you're coming That's from. That's a great fucking place to do. Like yeah. when you have a bunch of little kind of uh, nebulas to go to and you can kind of get different reads on people. That's yeah. such a cool place. Did, were you rotation going. Yeah. Were you living in the city at the time? So I was... So I'm from Monroe, which is like the boonies. Okay. Like it's between Detroit and Toledo to do the like cliche. Like sure. it's down in the corner of Michigan. So halfway between Detroit and Toledo is where I grew up. And then so if you go forty minutes north Detroit, Detroit forty minutes south Toledo, forty minutes like uh, what would you call that? Uh, uh, east? No, that would be west. Northwest. northwest forty minutes yeah. northwest Ann Arbor, which is the college town. Right. So and you were I, right in the middle of all that. Yes. And so I and I started when I was 17. So I was oh, wow. like, yeah. So I took a, a comedy class at one of the clubs, the Comedy Castle. Were your parents supportive? Yeah. I was just talking about this the other night. They were supportive in that. They were like uh, fair about it. But what happened was I accidentally made them supportive in that I took this comedy class and I had the graduation show, right? Sure. And they were like, we want to go. Sure. And I was adamant that it was like, you can't go. I was like that too. Because I was like, you're not going to like it. I'm going to say stuff you don't like. I'm going to swear. Like, you're going to, you're right. not going to like it. And I was like, you cannot, you are not going to be cool about it. So you cannot go. And so I was so adamant about it that they almost were like, no, we want to prove that we we're that cool, we're cool. That you negged them. Yeah, you I didn't negged even them. intend on doing that's it, but so that's what funny. happened. And oh, so man. then they went being like, no matter what he does, we have to not give him shit about it because they're the cath. Like my mom's very Catholic and stuff. Sure. And so uh, they went into it being like, we're not gonna. You just go up there with like it. you know fucking upside down crosses in your hands. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, right. You're speaking in I tongues. Had, I had a Jesus crucifixion joke that I, I ended up doing on Conan like years later. It was That's a really early so joke. So funny. Um, but uh, then I went. But it was two things. So they were like, we have to prove we're cool. And then those a gr- comedy class graduation show, it's packed. And it's like the most supportive crowd you're going to see. Sure. So I did really, really well. Sure. So then they were like, oh, he's good. Right. Like they, their first uh, taste of it was me doing really well in a club in front of strangers. Like I had my folks and like two friends there. And then everyone else was strangers. So their their first interaction was like, oh, he's like he's actually like good at this, I think, even though I was a really young comic. So then they were and I got like breaks kind of like little like I would win like some local contests and stuff like that. So they were like I had like proof if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. That they were like, oh, I think he's also I had no other prospects like I wasn't particularly good at other things. Yeah. Yeah. So then they were like, oh, oh, yeah. Like he actually he's actually figuring this out, I think. Sure. So, So they were like and I didn't fight. I went to college. I didn't fight him on that. So then that was probably what where most people would butt heads. And I was very like 
when I started saying, I was like, oh, I love this. I want to do this, but I don't know that it's possible. So that must have been interesting yeah. going to college because uh, I was doing stand up when I was in college, but I didn't start until halfway through. Mm -hmm. I almost part of me is kind of glad that I wasn't because yeah. it gave me sort of this perspective of, oh, this is what regular college is without doing stand up. And it fucking sucks. And I hate every second of it. <laughs> and with stand up, it's bearable. Yeah. So I was able I had to a sort similar of, experience. It ramped up yes. more and more and more and more. The first, yeah, my first year was like, my first year of stamp was like uh, end of end of high school and the college was very, there's a lot going on there, you know, so I wasn't, I was going up a couple times a month that first year and then it was like going up constantly. Were you the cool guy doing stand up? Was it like, oh, Brad? No, I think, <laughs> I mean, I think some people thought it was like neat if they liked stand up, but right. most people like. Uh, cause I, you, I think you must have gone to college. Lame. Did you yeah. go to college around the like Dane Cook boom? This was post Dane Cook. Post boom. Dane Cook. Yeah. Dane Cook was more like high school, middle school yeah. kind of thing. So, and it wasn't like stand up until like really like Netflix era. Mm -hmm. I don't think it became as a main, it was still kind of a niche nerdy leaning thing. I at guess that, that's true. At, at that time. It, yeah. was, it wasn't like very like cool like people knew like cat williams and dane cook and that was it <laughs> they were like oh are you like cat williams? yeah yeah those i remember those were like that's who people most right. people could what color suit know. do you wear when you're <laughs> yeah. on stage i wore a blazer in my first year really yeah. whole first year yeah the whole if you see a picture of baby face me with a blazer on that's your one me and will yeah. senate uh me and will senate talk about this all the time but when we started comedy I, you never know where these things come from, but he and I both had this thought where we are going to be clean cut, well dressed stand up. And did you wear a suit? Never wear, never a suit, but always a like long sleeve button up, like nice pants, <laughs> hair done. Like I had a short like crop. And I look at pictures of me back then, and I'm like, who the fuck would like you? <laughs> yeah, you look like a narc. I yeah. look like a fucking... I, I, I truly would look at old pictures of myself, and I'm like, if I was in an audience and this guy went on stage, before he said his first word, I think I would be like, I, I'm going to take get a drink right now. <laughs> like, just no, no semblance of, like, inviting. The thing that I look back on like that is, like, I was a literal child... Yeah. And had and like no jokes so about funny. that fact. Oh, it's so. Funny. I was like, no, I'm just like, I was like, I'm just a comedian. Yeah, and I wouldn't, I didn't understand that it's like, no, it's like crazy that's how young good. you are. I, I think that's yeah. good because like people have when I was early in stand up talking about bad advice. I had people always say like, oh, you should do jokes about like being athletic and good looking. And I was like, <laughs> no, yeah. I don't want That's to. That's a tough sell too. Yeah. It's also just not how I see like myself. So uh -huh. going up there and being like, oh, but it's like, no, I don't want to do that. It's right. not. I've also, because th their, their whole thought process is like, Oh well, that's what an you have to talk about what an audience is thinking about. Otherwise, like they're right. going to be confused. And it's like, or you just get them to think about other stuff. Yeah, like there's some truth to you got to get your foot in the door. Yeah, like I, I get like up top, you have to kind of address it. But I just wasn't doing that, you know. What? So, also my second yeah. time on stage, my first two mics, I like did address it. The first time it was like a riff up top, which I'm kind of impressed. I had the like, I knew to uh, to riff to riff crazy, up top, crazy, and it, but it landed. Great. And then the second time I had a written joke about it, and it bombed. And I yeah. was like, I'm never addressing it again. <laughs> <laughs> and then I never did. Yeah. And, but now looking back on it, I go, oh, you should. You that's should that's why that. it took you a minute to get everyone on board. Because they're like, what is this kid doing? This in baby here? doing in yeah, front of us. I think Mulaney had a, a joke on one of his. I saw him and he looks. I saw this clip. Maybe it was like live at Gotham or one of those shows. And watching it now, I'm like, he looks like a child. Yeah. But he had a joke about, about like that fact. And I was like, oh, I did not put that together. At all. I, I guess know? I looked yeah. older, so I never really had to worry about that. Yeah. What Other than uh, comedy, what was Michigan like? Like, what was growing up there like? Uh, it was fine. It was pretty chill. Like, it, I, I didn't... Suburbs? I, I, uh, uh, kind of the sticks for me. So like, was it, it was... Like, Monroe, where I grew up, is like beyond... 
there's there's suburban parts of it, but I was on the on the fringe of this small, very small city. And so I was like, the next city was Carlton, which is like small town, like one stoplight kind of right. thing. I was on the fringe between those two. So oh, it was kind of like, uh, there wasn't a, I, I think part of the reason I became a comedian and have this kind of weird life is because I was like um, extremely bored. Yes. Like I was left alone a little too much with and had cable. Also, the, you know? I always find it interesting, like a lot of comics, uh, they have p- at least one part of their life where there's extreme contrast, like or a level of contrast, and it's like like how, how you just said you grew up in the middle of these two separate kinds of environments. It, it it does because it's like the core of it really is understanding like differences and the contrast, and mm-hmm. it, it, I always find that funny. Like at one point in most people's lives who end up doing this, there's and some people have it built into their character. Some people have it built into their identities. But there's always something like that, like a sort of middle ground. When you were like going to school and stuff, did you ever have a concept of like, oh, this is a small town? That like, or did you sort of not even have an idea of how small your environment was? I I remember thinking that it felt as though and it was it wasn't a thing that like upset me but i remember being aware like as a kid and and through high school that i was like there's kind of just sports like yeah. that and i wasn't athletic oh, at all yeah yeah but that yeah. was truly like from it felt like from kids to the adults right it was like it felt like that was the only thing that mattered at oh. all and i was I, I was unathletic and wasn't a huge sports fan like i was a red i like the red wings and stuff but i like wasn't a huge sports guy so i was just like there's only one thing and this is uh, this is the thing and i and so i it was i was aware of that i was like i feel like that's not normal for there only to be kind of one thing to be interested in no as far as sense. as far as like small towns go that is the most typical synthesis of a small town is there are sports if you aren't good at those you are worthless until 18 <laughs> yeah until 18 you mean nothing that's why uh my folks i think were happy when i found stand-up because they were like not that they were um mad at me or anything but they were just like I don't know what this kid is gonna. I was just kind of. I didn't have a thing. Yeah. And I and I would try things. I like took guitar lessons. I couldn't figure that out. Sure. You know, like I uh, I didn't have a thing. So then when I'm 17 and I do something, I'm actually like notably good at it. I think my dad was like, "Oh, cool! Like yeah. this is he found a thing to do." Yeah. When when you're like in a small town like that and you find something, I really do think. It is rare because a lot of those people, like a lot of the people I know, and and I I didn't grow up in complete middle of nowhere. There Mm -hmm. was like a level of culture to my town. But the people, like the kids that were sort of on the fringes, sort of not into the whole like jock mentality, get a job with your dad thing. Uh A lot of them fucking are like, they, they were just sad. Like in the the ones that didn't get out of the town, it's like they couldn't find an outlet. I had, um, I was, I didn't occur to me until like the, the, like the height of the pandemic of like, cause I, I started standing at 17 and was like doing that until the pandemic and I had to stop. Yeah. And I thought, I had a uh, teen angst. Right. When I was, a, before I did stand up, I thought I was, I was kind of s- sad or whatever, but I thought it was just, I'm like, that's just being a teenager. You're like, you don't really have autonomy, but you kind but you have to like have a job. Sure. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like I had a job when I was 14. Me too. But then you're like, but I also have no freedom whatsoever. So I'm like, it makes sense why teenagers are angsty. But then when I had to stop, stand up for like a year basically i got really uh like bummed out like depressed for lack of a better word and i was like i was like oh i feel like a how i felt when i was a teenager again so when you said that i was like that's a hundred percent accurate yeah because it was like i was kind of a little mopey on the inside and i found an outlet and then i was good 
and up until I had to stop for the you know unprecedented <laughs> right <laughs> historical event historical you know? event yeah, now yeah. when when like Moby Brad like yeah. Moby Brad pre stand up Brad <laughs> yeah, what yeah. was what was he doing what was he into uh that's what I was like kind of I was consuming comedy I would make comedy videos that were like bad like very derivative like bad vi- but I had like a camera yeah. and uh figured out how to edit on like we a did there will movie be crayons. Do, do you know the movie There Will Be Blood? My <laughs> yeah. friend Tim Gonzalez uh, put me in a video called There Will Be Crayons. That's amazing. And it was There Will Be Blood, but with instead of oil, it was crayons. It's so funny. Like we're so uh, we're in step on this because like I we made a video. My friends and I that was like you know don't do drugs. We sure. did don't do rugs. <laughs> where it was like a guy like who's addicted to like this static yeah uh shock of a of a rug that's yeah. really funny yeah <laughs> see the extra st- if it was just a guy who was addicted to rugs it'd be like okay but the static shock was like, that's reason, very smart in movie maker there was this little effect you could do that was like a it looked like a little electric line mm-hmm. and so i was i could use that for like kind of a looney tunes ask and like none of I all of like that. i'm glad none of these videos are like out there because they're like atrocious but um if you can find those videos no no, please please post them online tag tag the dancers podcast i have to (laughs) this is comedy's my job now (laughs) (laughs) i'm like no i have to i have to be professionally funny i I have a few friends not uh which is way worse because this is this is one of those things where it is sort of a strange blurred line but i have a few friends who have let's say incredibly lucrative jobs in comedy now oh wow who will tell like often say man there were videos i made when i was 15 16 17 where Mm. if they surfaced my job is gone yikes yeah yeah stressful more than one person more than one person like they were you know because when they were 15 16 17 Mm. Their taste in comedy was probably fucking like it's what's on TV at that time. And also, yeah. with with my generation, it's like one thing me and my friend, especially in New England, because we're so adjacent to New York and stuff. Mm. Opie and Anthony, right, was right, the, edgy, edgy stuff, edgy yeah. stuff. Thank God I wasn't really making anything up until like I started comedy and I kind of had a little bit more sense. But if you're like a kid and you're into mm. fucking Jim Norton and Patrice right. O'Neal, yeah. and you're you're just like, oh, I'm going to make... It's like, yeah, you're not going to want to look at those videos now. It's weird, too, because you, like... It's, like, literally... I hope people understand, too, with, like, that kind of stuff, that it's, like, kids, this young... Like, yeah, these are kids. These are... Children, um, yeah. Are going off of what's on TV. Yeah. And if you could see in t- 2009 what was on network and cable TV. Right. Watch like even like I watched during the pandemic, I watched Veep and like Oh yeah. Oh season yeah. Season one of Veep versus the last season of Veep, you see the whole arc of the right. kind of culture shift, which is a good thing. But it's like insane. And then you go like, well of course everyone was saying ignorant shit or whatever. Because look and at also look also at that- uh look at what uh was what the what the most high profile comedies were dude you know, we were watching family guy or whatever exactly we, we were watching old 30 rock and mm-hmm. there's a scene where uh alec baldwin needs to impersonate tracy morgan's family oh, and just does full-on black voice yeah and man. it's really funny i mean oh, no. it I, no it it like the it, you have to if you watch it you'll understand the way that he sells it and i also the added level of ridiculous where it's like Alec Baldwin is doing right, this, right, yeah, a, like heightens it and adds to it. Mm-hmm. But it's like, yeah, back then it's like that was the shit. Yeah, that was the stuff people were way into. But it's like such a weird, like it's a tricky thing where it's like you kind of feel like a uh, with all the culture war stuff where you feel like a, a man without a country sometimes. Where you're like, yeah, if you're in favor of uh, of changing with the with the times and their discourse or whatever and you go like no like it's good to be sure it's not that hard to be thoughtful or whatever but then the um the the going back thing where you gotta go be like time is linear 
Right. Like, yeah. let's not like if someone says something in 2009 and then you go, it's like they said it yesterday. It's like, no, well, they said it in 2009. They said you, it in 2009. You know, which it doesn't make it good or whatever, but it's just kind of like, it's kind and of a weird, the, there's not a lot of nuance, no, the, I guess. You the know? thing to really consider about that is also in 2009, they thought they were acting as appropriately as we think we're acting now right, when right. we're crossing our T's yeah. and dotting our I's. And it's yeah. like, you know, everybody fucking makes mistakes. It, right, it, but right. even that, like, they thought they, even the stuff where they were like, oh, well, everybody makes this mistakes. That's not what they thought. Like, were, the, the things that they were doing where they were like, well, I know this is okay to say. Right, right, right. That, it, it, it's funny how that works. And it's like, yeah, I just taking consideration. But I think our brains just are not geared and gauged for the media intake and like nuance that we're presented right. with every day. It's just not how it works. And I was watching a really interesting video about like these two teens that were in some influencers video and were being mean to the influencer and the influencer ended up posting the video. Right. So those two teens got fucking like not not teen teens like they might have even been early 20s huh. they got like hammered like they got doxxed she's so fucked yeah. up yeah and, and they were like whatever they were being assholes in the video but that's no excuse for the doctor but the person uh who made the video was kind of trying to tackle the nuance of like it's obviously not okay to like do this to these young people but it's also important to know that you will not get fair treatment online like okay. you need to approach shit online as though you will not get fair treatment and you need to be okay with those consequences. And it's right. like, I kind of understand that right. because right. like whether or not it's fair, which obviously like a lot of people don't get fair treatment. Uh, it is how it is. Like that is right. the way we, we can't um, hold people up to these standards. Yeah. There's an, there, it's um, not a, sometimes it's, it's um, criticism. Yes. There, there's like a new it's a new and sometimes it's like valid point absolutely so it's like this thing of like there's definitely people who are like uh who who i think you see this with a lot of famous people who are kind of famous before the internet yeah. where they were used to zero criticism maybe yeah. someone would write something in the newspaper and now you can get a, like a lot of well, criticism. No, they got and, anti. Yeah. They got the opposite of criticism, yeah. which is like praise. people would be like, no, "Well, not I'm yeah, that." That is a good point. <laughs> that would be praise. Yeah. No, I'm saying like people in their orbits would be actively told, "Don't talk about this." You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like if somebody was acting like an asshole, was being racist behind the scenes, people were actively like, "Don't, don't fucking mention Jeff over there." Like I, I, I know with people who you know, got fired recently where it was like an open secret forever. Like these open secrets in, uh, in Hollywood specifically have been big for a long time where you are actively discouraged from criticizing people. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That's a weird. Yeah. Cause, and then it's like, there's a whole power dynamic of that of like, yeah, if being around like a fucked up person, but like you're trying to keep your job or whatever. You That's know, the like, great yeah. thing of focusing on stand up because obviously when we get to like the TV level and the Netflix level, this changes. But for the most part, like as opposed to acting, acting, if you're going to make any money, you have to deal with this structure and system that in many ways is like a a uh, bastion of evil, you know? <laughs> right, right. But in and in stand up, it's similar. But with us, we're dealing with like one shitty club booker named Jeff. Right. And right. Jeff is like not a great guy. Yeah. But there's one of him. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And right, he, right. Sh sure, he controls that club. Right. Right. But that's it. Right. You know, there's yeah. not there's not like as much until you get to the higher levels. It's a little more fragmented. A little more frag. You know, yeah. you can avoid Jeff. Yeah. You can stay yeah, away you from can Jeff. Try to, yeah. Yeah. Minimize Jeff if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Minim that should be. That's the slogan. Minimize Jeff. Just minimize Jeff. Yeah. Um, we got a few questions. Here we go. We got two questions. Uh, this one is titled height issue. Uh, hey, Dan. Love listening to the podcast. Thank you so much. I need some advice for dealing with friends. I am a 24-year-old man, and I am 4 foot 10 and skinny. I'm not overly insecure about my size, mostly because it's just something I can't change much. 
but my two closest friends, six foot tall, 30 year old and five foot 10, 32 year old older than you, older friends. I noticed that too. Yeah. Um, sometimes bring out my insecurity. Sometimes they call me buddy or big guy. Oh, big guy. You got it. You got to know to not call a shorter guy, big guy. Yeah. That's a little, I've that's done a... it before in my <laughs> younger years. I absolutely have. Uh, you just got to get that out of you. You got to stop doing it. I don't that. love buddy either. Whatever. Buddy's not, buddy's not good, but yeah. buddy can be well, colloquial. But, you know, it's weird. Buddy is okay. Bud. Whenever people would hit me with a bud, I felt like they were condescending to me. Yeah, I, I don't know do why bud. that is. I, I say hey buddy, but I think that's buddy. No, buddy's fun. New but, England thing. Uh, bud is like Bud's tough. Yeah, it's like what, what, I'm, you're not my stepdad. What are you? <laughs> okay, I read the next part. This is I'll read the whole thing because the next part is very notable. Oh, okay. so, sometimes they call me Bud or Big Guy or even tossle my hair. Don't that ain't for great. That. Don't that care ain't, for it. That ain't great. Or sometimes when I'm reaching for something, I can reach still grab it before me to get to it. It's small things. I wouldn't say that. Um, that wouldn't be a big deal if someone sees it from outside looking in, but it's kind of a jab at my ego, and I don't know how to talk to them about it without looking like I'm complaining about them being nice to me. Do you have any advice? Well, first off, I don't think it's necessarily a small thing. It's not that they're actively trying to demean you but tossing your hair yeah that's a that's that does feel like an overstep feels like an overstep because i will say it's funny like it sounds like they're doing a lot of these sound like bits but there's a spectrum to these bits and some of them i feel like are okay because they're decent bits but some of them are yeah. a little like tossing your hair that's a shitty bit this is the issue that's the, not good but the, grabbing something you can definitely grab before you can grab and be like here you go that's kind yeah. of funny this is the difficulty <laughs> you know in the difficult uh sort of landscape of male friendship <laughs> is you're constantly and i like this I think that we're allowed to make fun of each other right. in a way that in most social contexts would be seen as taboo right, right, in, a, right. in a comfortable, safe place. But it is also a rife breeding ground for negative behavior. <laughs> right, right, right. And if you don't check it, which is yep. what I'm going to say you should do, if you don't check it, that's what it becomes. It right. becomes this like sort of negative uh, space where... Everything that you do can be played off as like, oh, well, I was just, I was, I was just kidding. joking. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. This, yeah, if it, you don't want to become, uh, there's like good natured, yeah, stuff, and then it it can start to become a little passive aggressive or something, and that's you don't want that. You know? Oh yeah. yeah. Or here's what you can do. I mean, uh, the six foot guy, you should start calling him five eleven. <laughs> that I mean, honestly, yeah, that'll fuck if, with. If him. you yeah. really want to get to a six foot guy, start calling him five yeah. eleven. I mean, five ten. Do it like you believe it, though. Five ten is five eight. I'm five ten, and I'm also five eight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm basically don't 5'8". don't do it like, hey, I'm calling you five eleven to fuck with you. Right. Yeah, when you he to... fucks with you, right. when he, when he messes with you, just go like, oh, I'm Tim. I'm five eleven, <laughs> so I can do whatever I want, and he'll be like. Because then it sounds like you genuinely think he's five right. eleven, and right. that will fuck up his day. Yeah. You're calling him. You're calling him five eleven as a way to say like you're exaggerating his height almost. To yeah, eleven. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I genuinely thought you were five eleven this whole time. That's, That's how so you want to play. Fucking it. funny. Yeah. Also, just feel free to punch them in the balls. You're <laughs> right. Was, yeah. There was some animal part of me when I was reading this. I was like, all right, you gotta. I guess you gotta break a beer bottle <laughs> and like be like, well, you let's dance right now right. just completely blow it out of proportion dude let's if someone said let's dance <laughs> i would that's one of the scariest because someone who says let's dance have has been in twelve thousand fist fights i always thought it would be funny if someone started a bar fight i've never i've like never been in a, in a fight uh but like i thought it'd be funny if someone started a bar fight by yelling live from new york it's saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> it's so long <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um it would really take people aback for a oh, second yeah. yeah um but no i i would say like broaching these subjects especially in male friendships is uh difficult because it does make you if you're not developed in it it does make you feel like a bitch going like like could you stop doing these things that make me feel bad but just know 
it's the strong move in this situation. I think that's what a lot right. of people don't understand. The strong move in a situation where someone is making you feel bad is not to take it. It is to address it because right, right. The, the like repression is not strength. It's never strength. Yeah, I think it's the trick is communicating what you're saying in yeah. a way that doesn't um uh that if you're insecure that you're like if i try to communicate this they're gonna right. like rag on me more or something it's more of like translating that that uh truth into something palatable for a dumb guy right so like it was like I know, I feel like if I was in this situation, it wouldn't be like in my head, I'd be like, you know, when you do this thing, it makes me feel this way and it's, right. and, and I don't like it for this reason. You, but it, in reality, what I would say is if someone tussled my hair, I would, oh. I would, I would, I would say, eh, that's enough of that. Right. Yeah. And that, that would be the extent of like the, that, that all those emotions would come out is, is it's like Midwest shorthand of just like, and eh, that's it. And just by tone, you would be like, oh, he doesn't, he genuinely doesn't like it when I do that. Right. Kind of thing. But it's like translating, packing all this information into something palatable for I, your dumb friends. I like that a lot. Yeah. You know? No, that, that could be the way to go. Or you could just directly be like, hey, listen, like, I love you. I know you're not doing it to try to hurt my feelings because you're my friend, but mm -hmm. sometimes when you do these things it makes me feel a little bit upset it makes me feel a little self-conscious about my height mm. if they are your friends they will hear you out on that right 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 because i've had stuff like that because especially with my friends i can be a little bit uh let's say boisterous and i've had them uh <laughs> talk to me about that in both like you fucking stop that right now or right. calmly and both both times i'm like well this is coming from a place of hurt and i should stop Right. Actions. Right, right, yeah. right. And it's like if they're if they're kind of if they're your friends they'll they'll hear you out. And if they're kind of if they are kind of like just being mean, the cl the cliche th thing about like bullies that right. is like true is like if you just call them on it, they will crumble. Right. Like that's what that's like tale as old as time. Oh yeah. Is if someone's kind of bullying you and you go like what are you? What you, are you? Why are you, why, bullying why are you doing that? Yeah. Then they're whoa, whoa, what, what? You know, like it always, it kind of always goes that oh, way. Oh, it feels so, so yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. If you if you get called a bully and you have any like level of empathy, it's <laughs> it's not a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first off, loving the podcast. Keep it up. Hey, that's very nice. I've been keeping the videos playing on YouTube when I have work to help you out, friend. That's so nice. That's really watch nice. Hours? Are you kidding I me? Just, when I put a, I put the special out on YouTube, and I was like, a couple of people were like, "I let him run," you know. Like that, they, yeah. They're like, "I listened to the album version or something," but they're like, "I let it run." When you, you listen know? to Brad's special, let it run. <laughs> uh, now to my question. How do you deal with a negative partner? My boyfriend is a great guy, and when he's happy, everything is smooth as butter. But he gets mad over everyday trivial things all the time. He calls and complains to friends so often, almost all of them uh, are getting fed up with it. Oh, so he's calling friends and being like, I fucking, I can't believe... I can't believe I my foot hit the ground this morning. Um, She's dating Larry David. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I have talked to my boyfriend about trying to be more grateful about life instead of complaining all the time. I have tried to give a bunch of alternative mindsets, and I feel he is starting to make progress. But more <laughs> progress has to be made. He's a 26 year old man, so I'm thinking next steps might be getting him to go on runs with me. I need some more ideas. What do you think would help? That what a great question. First of all, yeah. I'm really happy to hear that progress is being made. Yeah, that's good. That's that, huge. That's helpful. Yeah. I've had a lot of friends who when they were younger are extremely negative and with the right sort of tilting end up being much more positive. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's hopeful. Uh we've talked about this in excess, but I've do you know you know Cooper Lydon? Yeah. Great friend of mine. Boy has he Cooper made progress. the other night. He's yeah. so funny. He's mm. so nice. And he, shout out to Cooper. He's such a great example of this because 
Like when he was when he was younger, he, I, I would be like, man, like why aren't like what's going on? And I would be like, oh, you're fucking eighteen years old. Like <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course, like the fact that you're even even able to get up and do this is crazy. So it's like sometimes it's just time, right? And that might be the experience, but it is funny. I would I would wonder like. I wonder if there's a core of the complaining because usually when you're complaining about little stuff, a lot of the times there's like maybe a bigger thing going on. So maybe like that a general dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. My my take because everything you're saying it sounds very helpful. I, my take yeah, is please. don't uh, don't make a curmudge and go on a run. <laughs> don't make a cranky man yeah, run. Don't make a cranky man run. Don't make a cranky man run. I don't know run. if that's gonna fix it. You know what cranky but... people like? Walks. There you go. That's oh, true. A cranky little walk is nice. Yeah, yeah. Walk it off, you know. I think I think a walk would be good. What are other good cranky activities? Maybe paintball and get it out a little bit. <laughs> paintball. A little bit of paintball. You can't suggest paintball for every question that comes up. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes back to paintball. Listen, I know you don't have custody now, <laughs> but in the meantime, maybe paintball. Nothing a little paintball can L fix. Nothing a little paintball can't fix. <laughs> um... No, it sounds like you're doing the right things, honestly. It's like sometimes when you get a question, you're like, this is a fucking nightmare and I don't know how to answer it. I think the the only thing with this question is it seems like you're doing the right steps. You're yeah. trying to push him to be more grateful. Um, yeah, yeah, making someone... It it sounds like those kind of things is usually people are not aware they're doing it. Right. And then when you kind of point it out, then they're, and then they have to kind of look at themselves and be like, oh, yeah, I guess I am kind of complaining a lot. Or whatever, Do you, you know? on the scale of like uh, complaining to non-complaining, complaining to grateful, where do, we, where do you lie, would you say? I would say, I like right now, like I feel like I was really positive when I was young. Yeah. And that, and it's, now i i have to work at it because it's it's uh i don't like i don't i liked it better when i was naturally right very positive and optimistic and maybe naive right um and now it's like I'm, i worry about becoming like jaded or bitter or whatever and i'm like i don't want to i don't want to be that it's guy it's a tough but fucking it, road especially man. uh la can kind of can yeah. like exacerbate it a little bit uh so i i think i'm less positive but i i try to be positive does that make sense well, i try to i try to keep that at bay i don't I, there's the negativity is there but i don't like it about myself i'm like i wish that wasn't the case the you know? tough thing is it's a city that markets itself off of pseudo positivity in many right, ways right. like the white people in la for the most part are just like <laughs> oh my god like every day is sunshine and you have to wake up and you have to write eight things you're grateful for and then you have to, and it's like but then you actually look into the core of their lives and it's like oh you're a, you're a demon you're a <laughs> demon at an epic level uh -huh. that is like sort of uh skirting over that with this like pseudo positivity workshop that you're selling for 84 dollars a month online it's right. it's crazy like i think that's really what makes people so negative about the city is like when you have something where the facade is one way and you realize it's bullshit, it really tilts you the other direction. Yeah, yeah. That, which is tough. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's a... Uh, every once in a while, I feel like I'll be like, I get, I'll get wrapped up in like, you know, especially comedy and stuff. You you can get wrapped up in what, what's not going your way or whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, but everyone, this is like, this is like cliche, but I'll uh, smoke a little bit of weed or something yeah. and I'll find myself getting very grateful. Yeah. I'll be like, yeah, I, was like, I, got, a, I got a good thing going. It's oh, maybe okay, that, you know? maybe smoke a little weed. Yeah. That's like, that's like a hacky thing, but like, yeah, it's like, that's might take that job. Honestly, when she was, when, when she did genuinely was like, maybe if he starts running, he'll be less cranky. Something if we're going like human level, it's like, uh, like I got like a low blood sugar thing. Yeah. And my, my wife will straight up be like, if I'm a little like rough around the edges or something, she'll be like, do you need to eat? Oh, and then it's like, sometimes you're like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, yeah. It, that's exactly what it is. So sometimes it's like, I saw like a viral tweet that was like, if you, if you hate everyone, you need to eat something. And if you think everyone hates you, you need to go to sleep. That's so And I was like, funny. that's actually really helpful that's so life fucking advice. Funny. It was just like a viral tweet. I, I don't know who tweeted it. But. Yeah, the the big shit, like, 
like sleep, food, water, all that stuff is also it's, big. So yeah, true. if this, someone this guy might be dehydrated. I fuck. I do think I do think like as far as other people giving you advice, sometimes it can be tough. Like a lot of things I I have found over the years, you do have to just learn for yourself. Because if someone isn't like in a state of taking uh advice, it's not going to help. But what you can do is f- if the person is at least has a little bit of openness. You can nudge them towards the big stuff. Like, did you drink enough water today? Did <laughs> right. you sleep at all? Like yeah. those things actually do really help. That's true. Yeah. But you can't really like, I like suggesting meditation to someone. You might as well tell them to like learn rocket science. People, I think people at large too, you're in favor. You, everyone's in favor of a quick fix. Yeah. It's exactly. so almost going like, if you drank a glass of water right now, yeah. you would feel better. That's like a nice solution. Yeah. It medit dude. It's, you don't meditate at all. Do you? No, I zone out a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's close. It's so, yeah. So sometimes I'm, I'm like, I do it. Yeah. I, I do it all the time. I never prescribe it to people mm-hmm. just for that fact, because it's like, if you need a quick fix to something, when I start med, like I'll I'll take a break and I go back for the and I've I've honestly never heard this from another person, so it might just be that I'm an insane person. Mm. When I start meditating for that first month, I get so much more irritable. I get so much more Whoa. angry. Really? I'm so much quicker to anger. That's so. Funny. It's really funny, <laughs> but yeah, I'll like. I'll be like yelling at a fr- I'll be like, what the, why the fuck did that happen? Like, and they'll be like, what, what, what's wrong? I'm like, I fucking started meditating again. <laughs> Cause I think that's wild. I think what it does in the short term is it brings everything that's boiling under the surface that you kind of repress it, like oh, brings it up. And then okay. when it's, when it's in the surface, you're actually aware of the emotions that you tamper down. If, if you keep on the track and you keep going down, then you learn how to handle and deal with those emotions. But again, for a quick fix, it's like, yeah, people don't like it. People hate meditating. What is the, what is the, cause that makes sense to me. Yeah. Like everything bubbles up and now it's right there. Yeah. How, how does meditation, how do you um deal? What is that part of meditation? Like, yeah. How do you, how do you get rid of the bad thing? So, like, um, I just genuinely don't know. So no, yeah. you don't get rid of it. So, uh, meditation, like the number one thing that is like across the board with most forms of meditation is limiting resistance. Okay. So it's, uh, it's like awareness and then, uh, non-resistance. So those are the two things. So sometimes one moves faster than the other. So like if you're, let's say like I'm feeling anger in my day-to-day life, like no meditation, no awareness of it. I'm just subconsciously repressing it. That's like my sort of uh, default setting. Okay. So when I start meditating, I start being aware of this anger. And so that anger starts exhibiting. And then when you continue meditating, that level of awareness gets deeper and you start seeing oh, I'm angry at this because I'm resistant to it. And that level of resistance is completely (laughs) unnecessary. So I'm going to like slowly, naturally, you just stop resisting in that sort of way where it's like, you know, I I think like, uh, this is an example. I, uh, I started meditating and I'm very much like when it comes to criticizing other people, I, I, try as hard as I can to not do it, especially people in the field of comedy, because it's like, it's so worthless. It's so pointless. And it hurts you in the long run. There's no point. The people who are uber successful, usually to me, when I like see them and people I consider successful, at least they don't talk a lot of shit. And so I try to be like that. I started meditating and I realized, Oh, I'm talking shit more. Like I'm, mm-hmm. I'm talking, I'm like, fuck that. Like that, that sucks. Like that. Da, da, da. Yeah. That's and, the thing that got worse with age yeah. and time that I was better of, about like keeping at bay when I was younger, younger and stuff. And yeah. It's like, and sometimes it's cathartic, but right. sometimes it's like, it's one thing to be like frustrated with the system uh but yeah you don't want to you don't want i've also felt like a lot of people who are like the, the kind of comic who's like it's almost where you get you get to a point where you go so nobody's funny right because like yeah cause you like don't like anybody you stuff. like yeah they they usually um fizzle yes. out or then you see their stuff and you're like well, wait. well, I don't know that's, yeah, why a, you're being so critical. Dude, of that's exactly else. what I was. So, like, I realized not that I've never talked shit. I talk, no, but of I course. talk. There's, there's also a fine line between talking shit about um, 
like objectively bad right like it's bad for this reason opposed to just kind of lashing out at any totally anything, yeah or, or just things that you don't like yeah. but i realized as uh like as i meditated more and more it's like oh this is coming from a feeling of uh of like sort of internal uh resentment and thinking i deserve things mm -hmm. that was always there but I was just kind of packing it down. And by packing it down, mm -hmm. I wasn't expressing like my fullest self. I was I, I was like kind of muzzling myself and being the So as you keep going, it's sort of this uh it, it's kinda of like when, when you think about it, you ever clean out like a really gross water bottle, like you left <laughs> protein powder in okay, it. Yeah. You open up the water bottle and it fucking stinks. <laughs> like the room starts, and you're like, "Why the fuck did I even do? Th Why the fuck did I open this shitty water bottle?" Yeah, I should just move on from this water. Bottle. I should just, yeah. yeah. But then you clean it, and when I do, when I do that, and you finally clean it, and you get and it stinks, and you're like, need to you cover your nose, and then eventually it's clean. I have this feeling when I do that of like. Well, this water bottle was always in my room and always smelled this bad. It was just bottled up. And I have this feeling of release just knowing that it's not there anymore. I don't have to. It's it's clean now. Everything. It's like, you know, there, there's definitely other stuff that stinks in my room, but at least that has been dealt with. OK, that's what it feels like. It's like when you address the it's like putting your finger on it. Right. Kind of thing. The going. initial feeling is like, oh, this is like great. That's why where a lot of people stop meditating is because of that right. initial feeling. That's why I could see me doing one like, I don't know if this is helping, right. You know, kind right. Of thing. But it's like, you know, it's like a psychedelic trip. But a psychedelic trip, thankfully, is like only uh, 10 hours or whatever. In meditation, it takes like two years to fucking get over. So it's not very appealing yeah, a lot to of, people with TikTok. Like anxiety type stuff it feels like just being able to put your finger on it yeah helps because then you just go like oh i know what's happening big time you know kind of thing so it doesn't fix it but if you just know what's happening yes. you can deal with it a little bit better you know um that was great we hit the hour is there so jokes 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 is there anything else you want to plug uh just uh i got like an email list yes uh instagram follow me on instagram yeah i gotta, I'll put I gotta the instagram get that up. Great. Going and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, it doesn't matter, but it's joke, joke, joke. Joke, it's joke, joke. Actually. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. But and it's on, uh, I got it on vinyl. So on the off chance there's like that's a vinyl sick. person, I'll mail you a record if you want to, if you want to buy that. Yeah. Basically. Or, but you can watch on YouTube for free. So whatever floats Either way, your, do both. Floats your boat. Yeah. Do both. Thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. Have a good one. Bye.